just start by thanking Beckman Coulter. If you're not here, they can't hear. With the um, opportunity to come and share some of the work that I've been doing with the Cytoflex. Um, and um, so I'm from the University of York. And before I go any further into um, describing the biological applications we've put the Cytoflex to, I'd just like to give you a bit of insight into the department that I'm working in. So I'm part of the Bioscience Technology Facility and we're actually six labs housed within one unit. And so the idea is the users can have a one-stop shop for all their samples. And so we can take the samples on flow cytometry, then sort them and put them through proteomics or genomics or whatever wish they want for them. So the biology department at the University of York has a huge range of projects, grants and users. We have those that bring bugs to us, that's the microbiologist. We have those that try and infect us with all the germs and nasties and parasites that they might want to bring. Then I sometimes get green soup and that's the plant biologists. We also do some work with um, the mathematical modelers and trying to get data to support their mathematical theories and I'll be sharing some of that information with you later on. So the samples that we get brought to us in the imaging and cytometry unit are really very, very varied. So we've got our normal, typical blood samples and also primary cells from different tissue sites. But we've also, as I've mentioned before, we've got a lot of plant biologists. So we get protoplasts as well as plant nuclei, lots of different types of bacteria, all different sizes and all different fusion proteins added to them as well, not just GFP. We've also put yeast and pollen and protists through our flow cytometer, and I'll show you some of that in a little bit. But before I go any further with that, we'd just like to think about the behavior of cells. Because as cytometrists now, we're not just into immunophenotyping. We want to learn more about what the cells in our tubes or our wells are actually doing. We want to look at their behavior and their characteristics. So cell proliferation studies, we've um, seen a lot of work on that um, this week, as well as cell cycle and apoptosis. And we really need to remember that a lot of these applications can be put through to flow cytometry. But now I'd just like to share this movie with you, and this is a typographical movie of what some of the cells in your samples are actually doing and the diversity of their behavior. So here we've got a movie of um, microglial cells, and they are really busy bodies. They're all doing different things, and you can just have a brief look at it and pick out your favorite, but look here how busy these cells are. And over here, there's some division gonna go on. Did you see that happen? Pop, we've now got two cells. Now, these are twins, but this one here is not doing too much. This one's really busy. Now it's really gonna be hoovering up all the mess that's in this plate. And it's twins just sat there, lazy twin, not doing too much. Now here it goes, it's really gonna start hoovering up all the mess and tracking it as it goes along. And it is having an absolute feast of the mess that's on this slide. And it just keeps going and it's speed up. And it, wow, how is it gonna deal with all of that? Wow, it's big appetite. I hope, hope you're enjoying your lunch. And its twin is now divided and it's now eating this air bubble. It's gonna have a wind later. So, but those were twins and they had very different characteristics. So you really do need to think that it's not just the cells themselves after they've divided, they're not absolutely identical. They might go on to do slightly different things. So we named that cell Dyson because it hoovered up the mess. And for those of you that are familiar with the Dyson, it's an example of British engineering. It's elegant, yet simple, efficient and quiet, a world leader, but it's still a vacuum cleaner, only a vacuum cleaner. So let's just have a look at Dyson again in more detail and you can really see its activity. So this is just zoomed in. But it's an example of the characteristics of the cell and they're doing different things at different speeds and we need to remember that they are individuals. So this is another example of individuals within um, microglia activity and now we're looking at speed. So you can see that some of these cells are not moving very much, sat on the sofa, putting the feet up and others are really moving very fast. So as this is a spider plot, so the further they move, the far, further out those green lines are. So 
Then we wanted to have a look at the characters there, and we've got some Usain Bolts in there. They're hot off the blocks. But we can manipulate this system as well, and uh, we, can, we can dope our runners and see how they go. But we're going to try and slow them down. We're going to do the opposite to what some of the athletes choose to do and see what actually happens. And you'd think they should be slower, the doped slow ones, but we still have Usain that wins, and I'm going to show you that data now. So these are the control runners. These, is this working? These, these were doped. And then these ones down here were doped with um, cyclosporin, and this is over time. But we can see down here, this is, this is our Usain Bolt. Okay, he's been doped, but he's still the fastest, still moving furthest than any of the others. And sometimes we need to remember that these individuals are really important in the biological system we're looking at. They're not just outliers, they are real and we need to consider them. And there's been a lot of talk over the last few days about thinking about the single cell characteristics, single cell flow, single cell imaging, and the impact that they have in any biological system. So why, why how do they have that individual characteristics? Are they bigger? Are they skinnier? Do they have more protein? And we want to understand these details so that we can clearly resolve the biological situation that we're interested in. So if there's the population versus the individual. So this is now a classical um, slide that we've all seen, and we realize that these compartments are very false. There are multiple subcompartments within them, and the cells are on a journey. And we get a snapshot through flow cytometry of that journey that they are undertaking. But we want to know in more detail where they are. So cells then, this is a, a slide that shows more detail with increased resolution. So the cells that we have in our tube might start off looking like this. And, and for those of you at the back that can't see, I'll give you some arrows, a few pointers so you can see them. Still can't see them? No. Well, we use fluorescence to gain more detail, and that's just a crude example of that. And this is a nuclear stain, but we might want to look at the cytoskeleton or the internal components and the proteins that are within them as well. But further than that, we can quantify the amount of protein that are in these cells with flow cytometry by using a calibration curve. And this is just a, a quiffy kit with a beads that give a calibration of how many proteins there are on the this isn't working now proteins there are on the on these beads so we've got a calibration that curve that goes from 2500 um, targets up to 525,000 targets and we've now got our biological distribution shown in red there and you can see how broad that is but that's another thing that we need to remember as well that there is a mean intensity here shown of 55 proteins per cell, but there's quite a large range within that, and that's shown by the distribution in this peak. And this wasn't because the flow cytometer wasn't right, this was because it's real. And if we take our cells here in this room, now the average number of hairs on head is 100,000, yeah? But we've got some people in here that have got challenged in that department and we've got some people that have got about that average but we are all one subset in this room but there's a huge range of diversity and that's what's being shown here and that's what we need to remember sometimes when we take those mean and for instance intensity values we need to know the deviation within them and this is some data that we um, use this application for looking at the number of surface and internal proteins um, that we were interested in on the cell. And we can see that on the surface there was about 9,500, but then internally there was an awful lot more. Um, and, um, and why is that? That, you know, that? that was an interesting question, um, that some of the proteins are only active when they're on the surface, but we can then gain an antibodies that are specific for that protein and see how much is in the total cell compartment and that's the power of flow cytometry looking at different compartments within a biological system. Now it was interesting in this project that if we looked at the total which is shown in the blue bars and the surface which is shown in the red they don't correlate perfectly. So we've got some examples where we've got a lot of total but not very much on the surface in comparison. And so for a drug um, pharmacokinetic system, you couldn't just look at the total protein 
and see that if that correlated to the active number of transporters that was in that cell that might be able to influx or efflux a drug because it wouldn't give you a functional response and this needs to be considered within the application that you're using. So <coughs> on to the cytoflex now and resolution counts. We want to be able to see in more detail what is going on within our system and, and how do we assess that in a, in a flow cytometer? Well, I don't think we can see much detail in this low resolution image, but as we gain more information, the picture starts to become clearer and now I'm getting a little bit worried because my boss is in the room. And you can see this is Peter O'Toole. And, um, but if, with the increased detail within this slide, you can see that he's there holding a pint of beer and we're doing the work. This was taken <laughs> from an evening event that we hosted at the university in association with um, an ELMI light microscopy meeting and, and we ran the bar. Well, we ran the bar and he drank the beer. And you can see that clearly with the increased detail in this slide. And as the evening went on, it did get a little fuzzy. <laughs> so why is um, resolution and staining index important? We want to be able to see more detail in our data. And how do we assess that? Well, often we get out our eight peak beads, don't we? That's the first point. And so that's what we did as well. So we've got the Cytoflex here, and then we've got two other cytometers, and this is with a 488 laser looking in the Fitz channel. And um, so we can see the eight peak beads are very nicely resolved, and I've got some calculations that look at the data in a little bit more detail, but we can see that they have all performed very nicely. When we go to the PSI 5 channel of the 488, we can see that the Cytoflex has a clear advantage over this other flow cytometer here because peaks two and three are certainly not resolved as well, whereas they are with the Cytoflex. So, and those arrows show that. Um, looking at a different laser, looking at the 640 laser, we can see that all the peaks are present on the, on the instruments with the APC channel. But as we go out into the far red, again, we see some advantages with the Cytoflex over the other two instruments. Crunching the data through that and looking at um, the staining index, we can see the blue bars show the Cytoflex and there is an increased staining in index with the peaks one and two in the channels shown on the bottom there. So there is a particular advantage in the PC5 and the APC channel in the far red shifted channels with the Cytoflex and that will be echoed throughout the whole of this presentation. When we look at peaks seven and eight, these were the high intensity peaks, again you can see that the Cytoflex staining index is increased over the other two cytometers but it's particularly evident in the far red. And what does this mean for biology? These are just beads and that's all well and good, but we need some relevance. So if we look at weak signals in a single parameter histogram compared to a dot plot, we can resolve more in the dot plot. And I think all of us in this room would, would, would agree with that. So as the cells slide under the autofluorescent peak, we can't see them very clearly in a single parameter histogram, but we can identify them in a dot plot. But it gets to a point where even in a dot plot, it becomes a bit blurry and the um, accuracy of the resolution is not quite so good. But if you've got good resolution, the point at which this merges is, is more sensitive. So if we go back to now to our 8 peak beads and we've got the 488 laser and this is in the PSI 5 channel, we can see that these two peaks are not very clearly resolved. And that's a bit similar to the data I just showed you on the previous slide. Now, if we put that here and then put the Cytoflex data on top, it means you get that enhanced resolution at those data points. So moving on now to um, some more samples. This is just an antibody titration with a CD4RD1, which is a PE type antibody. And we can see the staining index on the y-axis and we've got the antibody dilution on the x-axis with the three different cytometers. The um, Cytoflex is shown in blue that we've got a very good staining index and it's comparable to the cytometer A in this case, which actually was a 561 laser, which surprised me because the Cytoflex that I was using was a 488 laser. And so I wanted to look in a little bit more detail as to how this managed to be so good, even with a 488 laser. And this comes down a little bit to the, um, well, my interpretation of that comes down to the um, photodiodes in the, um, 
side effects being APTs, avalanche photodiodes, and they have a very low noise. And with a staining index calculation, because you divide it by two times the standard deviation of the unstained, if you've got a very low noise level or very low standard deviation from the unstained, then you're going to get a higher index value. And so here I express the standard deviation in those cells as a proportion of the negative cells medium fluorescent intensity. So if the value was 1, then the staining index, then sorry, the um, standard deviation would be the same as the mean fluorescent intensity. And the, if it was lower than 1, then the standard deviation is less than the um, MFI. And you can see with these numbers, if you just focus on the, the cytoflex, they're all across the titration coming out at about 0.3, whereas the other cytometers, they were higher. So it was the low noise that was giving us the enhanced resolution and better staining index in the cytoflex. So looking at this further, this was work done by Andreas Spittler in um, the University of um, Vienna, and um, we stained, we both wanted to do the, the same experiment, and he beat me to it in time elements, so uh, I, I, I borrowed his data with his permission. Um, but what, what we wanted to do was um, stain with um, CD3, and then stain with CD4, FITSI, PE, APC, or Pacific Blue. Exactly the same clone and all purchased or, or given to us by, um, by Beckman called for antibodies. Um, and then we wanted to look at the, the staining index with the Cytoflex, and this is the Cytoflex S compared to a, another cytometer. So this one um, does have the 561 laser in it for the PE and PE tandem dye antibodies. So again, you can see the cytoflex, which is shown in red, has an advantage compared to the, the other cytometer. And this is particularly evident, again, and this is a different cytoflex in a different institution. This is particularly relevant and, and obvious in the um, further red-shifted channels, which is great. We also wanted to have a look at the um, linearity of the detectors in the cytoflex compared to the PMTs. So the cytometer A has got a typical normal photo, um, a PMT detector that we've probably got in most of our flow cytometers, and then the cytoflex has the avalanche photodiode. And you can see we've got this typical PMT nonlinear curve with the cytoflex perfectly linear across the whole of the detector range from a gain of 1 to a gain of 3,000, I think is the top level. It is, it is bang on linear for all the peaks of a um, five intensity um, bead population from PE, which means that the compensation element for the cytoflex is magic. It works beautifully in terms of using the gain settings to work to any compensation matrix that has been set within the system. And if you change your gain, it can then work out what the compensation should be because it is almost perfectly linear. And if you want more details of that, please um, speak to the Beckman Call to representatives in the booth and they will be able to describe how that works and how that magic occurs in much more detail. So data spread, that's something else we wanted to have a look at within the Cytoflex because um, if there is lower noise and the um, detectors are more sensitive, then we might expect there to be less data spread within our, within our biological samples and within the staining. So how did we look at this? So I took um, CD45 single colour on FITC, PE, ECD and PE size 7. We washed them and then they were fixed and then we compensated for all the other fluorescent detectors in the 488 laser line. We also looked at the staining index again because the data was there and, and why not. Um, and so the staining index echoed again what we'd found previously is that the Cytoflex had a better staining index compared to the other cytometer we are comparing it and with this was again very, very evident in the um, PSI 5 channel shown here by big difference between these two bars. Um, so, no, maybe not. so how, then we wanted to look at the, the, the data spread and, and how did we do that. So I'll just show you these dot plots to, to run through that process so you can try and make more sense of the bar chart shown in the, the later slides. So we have cells only and we have typical slanty type 
um, profile here with um, the autofluorescence being linear um, ratio across the two, of the two channels. And we have a mean fluorescent intensity shown here on the y-axis, which is the spillover from the FITSI in this sample, showing at 15.7 in the compensated plot being identical to the um, cells only autofluorescence. So I've managed to compensate correctly and that's all that was meant to show you. But if we look at the standard deviation now in the spillover channel, it's slightly increased in the compensated data and that's something that, that we typically see. And I wanted to have a look at how this is affected with the different fluorophores that we stained on these samples in the different systems. So what we then did is I ratioed the um, standard deviation in the spillover channel compared to um, the, that of the autofluorescence. And this enabled me to compare different cytometers because otherwise the, the fluorescence mean intensity values from one cytometer was going to be in the first log decade and in another cytometer was going to be in the, in the thousands. So this was a way to compare those, those data across the platforms. So now we have the cytoflex in red, and the lower values are the better values because we've got less data spread. So here we have um, less data spread from the FITSI sample into the neighboring channels shown in the cytoflex. And so what we then did is looked at the other stain samples to see how that compared. So again, this is the FITSI sample shown here, and we've got low data spread of FITSI into the other channels shown on this y-axis. And not surprisingly, when we take the PE sample, we've got the most data spread going into the neighboring channels beside that. But you can see in each case that there is less data spread in the cytoflex compared to the other cytometer. It's less obvious the further away you go from the channel that you've stained it for. So this is a PE sample and you've got less effect in the PE size 7, but it's so far, further red shifted from the actual stain we're looking for. That's not surprising. So now if we look at the ECD sample, we've got quite a large amount of data spread in the other cytometer, in cytometer A, but this is much lower with the cytoflex. So this was echoed throughout the whole of this, this data. So how does that look on the plots? So now if we've got um, the unstained here, and then this is a PE sample, and we can see the data spread is greater in, the other, in cytometer A compared to the cytoflex. And this will mean we'll be able to see more um, lower dim positive, double positive cells compared to the cytoflex. And that's just another example now with the PE size 7 stain sample. And you can clearly see compared to the unstained cells within the tube, the main data spread is less. It would have been more convincing and better possibly if I'd shown it on a bivariate prop, but hopefully you can imagine the trumpeting type effect that you would see or, um, if I had done that. So quantification then. Um, with increased resolution, you'll get better data and you'll be able to see more um, iterations from your unstained through to significant changes in your biological sample. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have um, an ecology unit and uh, they wanted to put vast numbers of um, paramecium through the flow cytometer. And paramecium, for those of you that can't remember your school grade biology, are ciliated protists. Now these are about 30 microns in diameter and they're anything from about 100 to 120 microns in length. But you can put them through the flow cytometer because the samples are aligned along their long axis so they don't clog the system. And what they wanted to do with these protists that have algal symbionts is to see how many symbionts are within the protist host. So the um, paramecium has the algae inside it and the algae then provide the paramecium with plant sugars so the um, paramecium then have an advantage. So um, they're ciliated single cells stuffed full of little green blobs. And the green blobs have chlorophyll in them, which we can then use the autofluorescence from to quantify how many are in there. Now, on the um, cytometer that we had, other cytometer that we had within the unit, we could only um, have the log data on height. Um, and this then meant that the quantification wasn't going to be as good because we wanted the area signal to be able to have a measure of what was in the whole of the um, paramecium 
compared to just the peak um, amount of chlorophyll. But on the cytoflex, we've got the paramecium shown here that contain the algae. We've got the free algae, and then we've got the bacteria. The bacteria need to be in there because when the paramecium don't get enough sugars and nutrients from the algae, they need something to chomp on, so they chomp on the bacteria. Um, so this is the, the cytoflex, and this is a, an, a different type of flow cytometer that I've just named called flow cytometer A. Um, and we can see the benefit now of the um, huge dynamic range of the cytoflex as well. So here we have a seven log decade. This is starting at 10 to the 2, and this goes up to 10 to the 7. And we have a benefit now because we could even see something below these bacteria shown here. So we've even got space within this dynamic scale to see even smaller things. So as I mentioned before, we were using this, this previous slide was using um, log height data, but we wanted to gain quantifying information as to the amount of algal symbionts that were in these paramecium, and, and so we needed, we needed an area signal um, to be able to um, work that out. Now, this is a confocal microscopy image showing the paramecium with the algae inside it, and they're not different colours, this is a heat map to show position in Z. So this is a, a, a MIP, a, a maximum intensity projection of a Z-stack confocal image. And if we start to count these, these are in blocks of 10, so we've got about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Think about what's behind there. You, you get to about 380. I'm not going to count every one with you because that would take all of lunchtime. Um, and so it, approximately there's about 300. So when we took the height data and divided the threat and intensity of the paramecium containing the algae and divided it by this fluorescence here shown by the free algae, we got to about 60. And there's clearly more than 60 in that paramecium. But when we took the data with the height, log height data, we could see we were closer to the number that we could actually visibly see within our confocal image. So this gave us some confidence that we were actually quantifying the number of algal symbionts within the paramecium. And this then enabled um, the ecologist to put hundreds and hundreds of samples through the cytoflex using the plate loader. They were putting about 400 samples a day through, and that's not trivial because these are quite large um, events that need to go through, so we needed to optimize the speed at which the sample was taken through into the flow cytometer, as well as optimize the washing and the mixing to make sure that we had a little carryover and we had the system set up so that it would be robust. And this data showed that these paramecium, they might be single-celled. You might think they're simple, but in one cell, they are able to eat, reproduce, and they can regulate the number of algal symbionts that have been inside them. Because if there's lots of light, there's lots of photosynthesis, so they kick some of them out. They're not going to host freeloaders. They're not going to host algal symbionts that they don't need. So it's not a complete symbiosis relationship. The paramecium is in charge and it exploits the algae. So it's turned a lot of the ecology and the mathematical modeling and some of the um, ecology-based arguments associated with symbiosis on its head. And um, so uh, that, that's been the, the ecologist actually said to me, it was Ewan Minter, he said, that the work that he'd done on the cytoflex with a plate loader and the optimization had gone better than he ever dreamed it would, which was quite satisfying to hear after all the optimization had been done. So cytoflex and hygiene. Now, by this, I don't mean does it smell. I mean, can it wash well between its wells? Um, and to do this, we um, used green fluorescent protein in bacteria because the other ecologists are bacteriologists as well, and, and they wanted to put lots and lots and lots and lots of bacteria through the system, but they needed to have as little carryover as possible for their data to be valid. So we took bacteria only, then we had um, a GFP bacteria clone, and then the next well after was bacteria only, and we saw no GFP positive cells after we had optimized the system for appropriate washing and back flushing. So that the carryover really was 
very, very, very low. And he certainly was happy enough within his biological system and for his data set that he would be able to uh, carry that forward. And they always put everything in R as well, mathematical models. I don't know if any of them, what is it with R? Why is it so special? But they love it. So they take all their files and they put it through R and then they make these dot plots that don't look anywhere near as good as the software that the, the companies provide. But they're happy and they're the users, so that's what, that's what we provide. So yes, it can wash between its wells, and no, it doesn't smell. So um, this is some data now that um, I've taken from the um, Royal Microscopy Society flow course. Um, we took the samples from there and ran them on the Cytoflex last September. And this is platelets in whole blood without washing. Um, and we can see that if we label the platelets with um, CD42B, FITC, or CD61PE, we can see that the platelets are in the region where the positive um, platelet-rich plasma positive control resides. But you can see that there is even space below that to see um, and verify. We're not pinching that platelet-rich plasma reading. We can very nicely see that it's clearly resolved. So now we're going to think about life and death with the Cytoflex. And before you all start running out the door, no, I, I don't intend that in a personal way. So we'll start with life because that seems more friendly. Um, so we've got cell cycle, and this is ethanol fixed cells stained with propidium iodide. And we can see the doublet discriminations very nicely. And now we've got G1, S, and G2 peaks quite clearly shown there. And these were samples that were prepared by Derek Davis, who works at Crick in, um, in UK. And these were done for the hands on flow cytometry course that we run in January and June. So what else did we do? We've got some more live cells. These are live, they're not fixed, and they've been labeled with HERX 33342 to label their DNA, and the dead cells have been labeled with propidium iodide. So we've got a nice plot here with our forward and side scatter plot. We've then gated on the um, live cells, and again, done doublet discrimination, and get our G1, S, and G2 peaks. They're slightly broader often with HERX3342 because they're live cells and so that the DNA um, binding dye doesn't quite have as good access as when they've been fixed with, um, with ethanol where it can bind very stoichiometrically into the um, DNA. But we can clearly see the different um, stages of the cell cycle shown there. Still sticking with, uh, with life, We've got BRDU labeled S phase cells now, and that's shown in this plot here. We've got a um, cell cycle profile shown on the X axis, and then we've got the S phase BRDU labeled shells, cells shown in uh, FITC labeling on the Y axis. And once these have been labeled, we can then track them over time in a pulse chase type experiment after 30 minutes, 6 hours, and 18 hours. And we can gate on those BRDU labeled cells that were labeled at time zero and see where have they gone to. And this enables you to track cell cycle over time, maybe after drug treatment or after biological intervention with an infection, um, and see how the cell cycle is affected in the biological system. And there's some data there showing in red where those labelled S phase cells have gone to. So now this is a nice feature with the, cyto, um, with the Cytoflex, and that's the, the zoom, zoom, zoom function. And you really can zoom into your data and adjust the um, x-axis and the y-axis scale to be able to interrogate your data in more detail. So, this isn't zoomed in um, PowerPoint, it's actually zoomed in the priority software in CytoExpert, and you can see this is the same data set, and this is all a bit scrunched up. As we spread it out, you're able to tease apart those populations in more detail. So that's a nice software tool that enables you to do more accurate gating. So this is where we come to the death in the afternoon phase, and this is a sub-G1 assay looking for um, DNA that is lower than a G1 level of DNA content, hence the name sub-G1, and this is a hallmark of cells not being happy, not strictly of apoptotic cells, but not being happy. So here is our G1 in our untreated and now treated, and we can see we've got a peak sub-G1 um, in the treated and they were um, uh, treated for an apo inducing apoptosis. 
um, and so that is, uh, that is visible there. Very nice resolution and good peaks on the Cytoflex. We've also got a TMRE um, assay. I always think that sounds like a cocktail TMRE, but it's not. Um, so we've got loss of membrane my potential being shown here. And here we have a decrease in fluorescence associated with apoptosis. And that's very nicely shown here, and the data is very, very clearly resolved. We've got Yopro staining. Now, this is one of my favorites because you get a parabola of death. Great phrase, that. So here we've got um, the untreated cells, not very many dead ones and not very many apoptotic. And here we have the healthy cells. When they start to undergo apoptosis, the membrane becomes slightly leaky for Yopro before it becomes um, leaky to the live dead discriminator, which is why you get an increase across on the FITSI channel, on the Y-axis channel with the apoptotic cells, and then as they really do um, undergo a death process, then they become positive for the YOPRO and the, um, and the live dead staining. But you get this really nice characteristic parabola with those two stains, which is great. An XM5 staining shown in a little bit more detail. We've got the untreated shown here. We've got positive staining in the FITSI channel with the XM5 in this case. And these are some scatter plots now, just so you can see how that data looks. And if we gate on the live cells, um, and then the annexin positive cells, they're shown in red here, overlaid, and then the dead cells characteristically shown with the increased um, properties there in the um, dead stain. This was DRAC7 used for the dead stain in, in this effect, and they have quite a different scatter properties, as you would expect. So... Back to a little bit more life and proliferation now in these samples. These cells were um, human T cells that were loaded for the CFSC to look at cell proliferation. The cells were stimulated with mitogen in the presence of um, human IL-2 and left for a week just to see what they would do and see what peaks we could see. Now, if you look at all of the T cells um, on the Cytoflex, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven peaks. If we split those T cells into CD4 and CD8, we can see that there's a little bit more proliferation in the um, CD8 T cells, and we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven proliferation peaks. And I think we can visually see that. I don't need to use ModFit to show you those peaks on there, but if we'd wanted to get more robust data, then we could put it through the algorithms. So then if we can um, look at um, cytometer A, we can see not quite so clearly those six and seven peaks with the um, CD8 cells. And if we then do a comparison between the Cytoflex data, which is shown in the top, compared to cytometer A, that resolution really does give enhanced biological information when we look at those peaks towards the end of the week's proliferation. Because this peak here which I think is peak six or seven, is, is not clearly resolved in the other flow cytometer, cytometer A in this case. So all that eight peak B data and all that resolution is starting to count, and we're getting enhanced biological information by that enhanced resolution. That's just a dot plot showing the same thing. So plants, we had a, a plant um, lecture uh, yesterday that was, that was very good and a lot of what he said in terms of using flow cytometry to be able to validate and verify the DNA content in plant can help us verify the ploidy status and the plant species that we've actually got what we might be trying to protect and I think the example he gave yesterday in the Czech Republic where they were protecting the wrong species of plant until they used flow cytometry to verify which, which area they should really be looking after. And this is what um, a master's student was trying to investigate last year using the Cytoflex. And we were using Echeveria, which is a succulent. And this is um, a Bolivia, oh, I can never say that, a Bolivian Echeveria. And we were trying to get DNA data to try and um, establish what is there before it was lost. So it was a conservation-based um, project that uh, we were trying to, um, trying to assist. Um, but first of all, we had to um, tweak the um, plant nuclear extraction protocols because we had a um, succulent and they can be quite difficult to uh, get the nuclei out of compared to a dandelion or a radish leaf, for example, just because of the structure of the, of the, of the tissue. 
But we used many different buffers and many different processes until we got something that we were, we were happy with. Um, and from this, we were able to compare the data to a biological standard, which is radish, and compare the, the DNA peaks. And we found that Echeveria had a greater content of DNA compared to radish. And within the um, samples that we were looking at, they were able to identify subspecies. And that work is still ongoing as master's students projects generally get taken from one year to the next. This is a, another example of um, a plant flow cytometry, and this is looking at polyploidy and radish. And you can see the resolution of these peaks with the polyploidy shown in a color gating plot here at the end. And I've um, done this plot here as well to, to show the double discrimination. But this is all the debris associated with this prep because it is very difficult to get pure plant nuclei out without doing some sort of centrigation step but we were worried that we'd lose certain populations if we went down that route but with the cytoflex we were quite happy um, to, to use gating to then identify the plant nuclei away from the, from the, from the debris and that worked very well. So it's not just about resolution, it's also about more information. And with the Cytoflex, with a three color system, you can study 15 parameters, two scatter and 13 color. And I've not gone through any compensation and multicolor plots with you today. I've more tried to give you a flavor of the biological application and the diversity of samples that you can apply to, um, to this, uh, this small but very powerful box. Um, so uh, this slide here just is it's a sperm image. It's Louise's sperm. No, that doesn't sound right. It's a sample of sperm that Louise brought to us and that we ran for analysis. And uh, I've just shared with you an image rather than dot plots. Um, the next slide um, shows um, some example of just a, a five color um, profile just to prove to you that we did do some normal immunophenotyping with this system rather than looking at some of the unusual samples um, and uh, the hematopoietic stem cell work we did as well but I, I spared you from a, a nine color plot with all of that to go through but just to give you a flavor of some of the multicolor work we did. So we've been able to resolve subtle details We've been able to study multiple parameters and look at many different subpopulations. Now, this is not an evolution in flow cytometry, but just a bit more power. And so with that, I would just like to share and remind you about the individual characteristics of the cells by showing these cells all dancing. Hopefully, if this movie will play. Um, but not only do we want to know if cells are dancing, we also want to know what tune they're dancing too. And hopefully, with more powerful flow cytometry, we'll be able to really get a handle on what the cells are actually doing, rather than just what is there. So I'd like to acknowledge the work of a lot of people um, within imaging and cytometry. This is Peter O'Toole, and um, we've got Graham and Karen and Joe, who helped do a lot of the work, and collaborators within the biology department for providing samples and allowing me to uh, pinch them as the days go by or weeks go by to, to run on the Cytoflex. I'd also like to acknowledge the help of uh, Bettman Call to Field Engineering and Brotherick, but also Alison Bell and Norman Maitman and Jane, and also from the service team as well, which are sometimes the unsung heroes of flow cytometry, and we need to remember them and give them credit as well. And thank you all very much for listening. Thank you.